So, the big question is this. How are ambitious people like us, who don't have a lot of resources, did not go to Ivy League colleges, were not born into wealth, how do we become resourceful enough? Use our creativity, our dedication, and a little bit of crazy to bootstrap our way to realizing our dreams. Whether it is launching a new company, launching a new app, or making it to the top of the corporate ladder. That is the question. And this podcast will give you the answers. Please like, share, and subscribe to get new episodes, videos, and other updates. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dream Show. I'm your host, Manu Jagarwal. And today I will be talking with Rob Meyerson. So Rob has about 15 years of experience in brand consulting, including senior brand strategy and verbal identity roles and major global consultancy uh, consultancies like Interbrand, Siegel Plus Gale, and Future Brand. Um, he was a global head of naming and brand architecture at HP, which is Hewlett Packard. Uh, when it split into HP and uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, He has experience working in US, China, and Singapore with client experiences all over the world. So welcome, Rob. We are excited to learn all about branding from you. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, so um, can you tell us a little about uh, yourself, your background, your experience? Sure. Like you said, I'm a brand consultant. Um, What that means is I help businesses build stronger, more effective brands. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes that means strategy. So I do a lot of brand positioning, brand architecture, if you've you've heard of those things. Um, But it also means identity. And I like to split identity up roughly into visual identity. So that's logos, color palettes, typography, things like that, and verbal identity. Um, And a lot of the work that I do is around naming, messaging, and, and things like that. Awesome. Uh, so I think you, you covered a, a bit of this question, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. So uh, a, a brand is, is basically an identity for a business. So uh, why is it so difficult to get it right? Like, you know, uh, uh, it's easy for us to identify ourselves by our name and whatnot. Uh, but why is it so difficult to get the brand right? Well, yeah, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> Our parents giving us names, uh, you know, was arguably easy or difficult, I guess, depending on who you ask and and who your parents were. Um, But what makes us us is so much more than our name, right? We have Mm -hmm. experiences, personalities, values, cultures that we come from. And it turns out that brands need a lot of those things, too, if you really want to build a strong brand. So in reality, it's not just a name and a logo and an ad campaign or even a nice website. It's um, beyond the super official it's uh, that complete identity all of the different experiences that that brand creates for consumers you want everything to be authentic to come from a true place um, relevant to the people that uh, you're building that brand for whether it's consumers or a b2b brand and ideally you want it to be differentiating too you don't want to be the same as every other brand out there Mm -hmm. Um, it turns out all those doing all those things is is a big challenge yeah so um you know, as a business, uh, uh, most businesses, they either produce a product or they offer a service. Uh, now, if their product or service is pretty high quality and it's satisfying their customers, is that not enough to build the brand or there is something else to it? Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a good, it's a great question. There's some quote, I think it's um, Drucker that says something about um, innovation and 50% marketing, or maybe I've got the percentage wrong. Um, The sort of conventional wisdom is that having a great product isn't enough, unfortunately. Um, And I think there are plenty of anecdotes of um, great products. The Microsoft Zune, for example, a lot of people said that just based on specs, it was better than the iPod at that time, but they didn't have the the branding clout. They didn't have the brand that Apple had or the design um, capabilities that Apple had. And so um, there's more that goes into it. Um, So, you know, you you need people to try the product for the first time too, to even discover how great it is. And so a lot of marketing and branding is just about drawing people in and creating that demand. I see. And so can you uh, work on your brand? Uh, Because, you know, there are a lot of tech entrepreneurs and professionals in the audience. So um, can you work on building a brand even before you're building your product or service? 
Yeah, I think so. Ideally, they should be done in, in tandem. Um, as you learn about who your audience is for the product and what you should be creating to make them happy or to solve a problem for them, um, a lot of those same answers could inform the type of brand that you want to build or the type of identity that you want to build around that product or company. Um, so I think ideally there's a little bit of a back and forth um, as you work on the product or setting up a company and building the brand for that company. Cool. Um, so let's talk about some of the famous brands and get your opinion on that. Sure. Uh, it seems like uh, Red Bull is uh, doing amazingly uh, as far as their brand is concerned. So what do you think about that? What, are, what type of strategies they use to like sort of enhance their brand? Yeah, they at least, uh, Red Bull at least used to be um, thrown out as an example uh, of brilliant branding. Maybe it, maybe it still is, but I heard that from, from Laura Reese recently, whose father, Al Reese, wrote a pretty famous book about branding called Positioning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's old now, but it's still recommended reading for anyone uh, interested in branding. Um, Red Bull is a good example of a few really critical concepts around branding. Um, what's really impressive is they took a product that um, has some unique qualities, but it's kind of just another sugary, somewhat carbonated beverage. Um, and what they did is they managed to create a category. And that's a phrase you hear a lot in branding. Um, they came up with, or uh, supposedly came up with this whole idea, certainly one of the, the biggest brands in this category of energy drinks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that ability to um, position yourself as something new um, is a goal for a lot of brands and creating a category is, is something that you hear um, mm -hmm. a lot of companies say they want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and, and you know, they, they sponsor all these extreme sports and, you know, some some crazy kind of um, uh, personal achievement. Uh, like, you know, there was a man who went up in space uh, in a capsule and things like that. Yeah, that was cool. So uh, how how, you know, how does that align with their uh, branding intent? Well, I, I don't know the brand that well, but they clearly positioned it around this idea of um, of extreme sports and uh, sort of doing uh, sort of feats of, of, not feats of strength, but um, uh, amazing things that human beings can accomplish uh, if they're driven and put their minds to it, like that, um, that guy who jumped uh, yeah. to the, the skydiving. So everything that they do seems to be aligned with that idea and their ad campaign um, backs that up. So um, a lot of really strong brands are able to build their brand around an abstract idea. So um, while they are an energy drink, um, they've also really tethered their brand to this bigger, more abstract, more um, aspirational idea of what are you capable of? And we see similar things from great brands like Nike, that it's really not about the shoes. You see their ads and you rarely see the shoes. Um, Apple, when they do have ads, it's not just the, um, the latest specs on the, the new MacBook. It's, it's something that makes you feel and has an emotional um, uh, hook to it and also some more abstract ideas. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, bringing it back to the, the startup scene, um, you know, all these uh, big names that we mentioned, they have billions and billions of dollars to spend on their branding and marketing. How right. can we learn from them and you sort of, you know, utilize those lessons uh, in a startup world where, you know, we have very limited resources or, or, or very, uh, you know, a shoestring budgets for marketing? Yeah, it's tough. Um, there, I think it's really just a question of knowing where to cut and, and where to avoid cutting. <laughs> you know, how much can you cut before you're really doing, uh, doing things the wrong way? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a fair amount that you can do in-house. Um, you need to kind of know where your skill set is. If you have a designer in-house, then maybe you, you're able to save some money on some design um, aspects. If you're really able to get your business strategy crystal clear, then that's going to help immensely with getting a brand strategy um, set. So I think the more you can do in-house um, and really sort of um, think carefully about how you brief outside partners, um, is one thing you can do. And then also there are a lot of um, freelancers now available that can do this kind of work. They may come from the big agencies and have that expertise and experience, mm -hmm. but not be charging big agency prices. So that's another thing to, to watch nice. out for. Nice. That's great. Um, and uh, I've heard this expression, uh, uh, you know, it's something that we, that a business is trying to do 
uh, or a company is trying to do is good for the brand, but it is not a good business decision. Have you heard that? Uh, yeah, and I've, I've heard the opposite too. People say, um, you know, that, that's going to be a great business, uh, great business decision, but it's going to harm our brand. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think it's really kind of misguided to, to separate the two. I've actually written something about this. Um, they're really tied together and sort of deeply intertwined. Um, I've just mentioned the link between business strategy and brand strategy, for example. And so I think really what, what people mean is there's good for right now and there's good for the long term. And so you can be opportunistic in the way you run your business and say, uh, hey, we could license our brand out to this company that makes something completely different. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Caterpillar, for example, famously licenses their brand out to a company that makes boots and shoes, mm-hmm. um, although that has gone well for them. Um, there are times that you don't want to do that. You could just frivolously um, license your brand out to make a quick buck, but then find out that the products that this other company was stamping your logo on are harming your brand over the yeah. long run. Yeah. Um, and so do you want to make decisions that will maybe boost revenue in the near term, but um, lead to a decline over the long term? Um, or do you want to, on the flip side, pass up some of those opportunities, maybe have a little bit of a harder time getting revenue scaled, um, but but be thinking about the next five, 10 years of, of building a company and building a brand. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's so true. Um, all right, so earlier we were talking about uh, naming and you know how our parents name us. Uh, uh, now, I see a lot of people struggle with this, like when they are about to pick a brand name or the company name. So uh, can you give us uh, you know, some of your thoughts on how you pick brand names? Um, yeah, so I do it um, <laughs> uh, in a very rigorous way um, that will not sound familiar um, to anyone outside of the branding world, but hopefully will sound very familiar to people in it. Um, we hear these stories of startups getting their names um, uh, out of a, a late night brainstorming session over pizza and a six pack or um, everybody throws an idea in a hat and then they pull an idea, the CEO pulls an idea out and that's the name. Um, maybe that really happens. Uh, maybe in the past that was possible. Um, but realistically, there are a lot of challenges with that. Not the, not the least of which is just legally, um, it probably won't surprise you to hear that a lot of great, you know, quote unquote, great name ideas are going to get you sued down the line because uh, somebody else is already using them. Um, and anybody who's ever tried to buy a domain knows that um, not that you necessarily need an exact.com, but pretty much any name or, you know, anything close to a real English word that you want to choose is already owned by somebody else. And that can cause all kinds of problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the process I use is um, coming up with a brief. Uh, I mentioned briefs earlier. So just some kind of document or alignment or agreement around what do we want the name to do? What do we want it to sound like? And so yeah. on. Um, and then coming up with, uh, believe it or not, hundreds or even thousands of name ideas. Um, usually that involves multiple people, um, experienced namers. It, it is a, a real job. People can be professional namers um, and they'll come up with hundreds of ideas and they'll compile a list and um, start to shortlist and then, try to get these names to jump through a couple of hurdles uh, or hoops for you. Um, Legally, linguistically, maybe domain wise, you need them to to pass all of these different uh, gates before you can really narrow it down to your final name. Cool. Um, All right. So uh, you mentioned the the book uh, positioning and interestingly enough, uh, I have a quote from there. Um, It talks about uh, some, this concept called over communicated society. So, Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, it's crazy. First off that they said that I think the book came out in the, maybe the very early eighties. So they said that before the internet, much less (laughs) Twitter and social media. I mean, talk about over communication. Um, so their whole thesis was that because of the barrage of, of ads, um, and they were talking about TV and radio and, and billboards, um, because we're so used to this, we're we're sort of numb to ads at this point because it's just constant. Um, You really need to have an idea that's going to cut through that that clutter. And so owning a specific idea in the mind, like energy drink for Red Bull, just owning that idea so that whenever whenever anybody thinks I need an energy drink, Red Bull pops to the the top of the list. Um, I think to some degree that's more more true than ever. 
there's there's so much out there that we talk a lot about making sure that your brand is simple, um, that you have a focused, single-minded idea that you're building it around. That idea, again, might be really uh, practical or, or rational, like energy drink, or it might be more abstract or emotional, like my, people say Nike stands for victory or or the spirit of the athlete or something like that. Um, there are different answers to that in different uh, situations, but but being single-minded is a useful way, I think, of, of making sure that you don't just sort of blend into the background noise of, of other yeah. communications out there. Yeah, you, you brought up a very good word, uh, simple. So, you know, that simplicity to achieve, uh, you know, it, it's obviously it sounds simple, but I think it's uh, very, very complex to get it to that uh, yeah. level of simplicity. Yeah, it's... Um, it's always hard, um, you know, with, with startups, you have um, usually founders who have big dreams and big ambitions for the brand and so sometimes, or for the business. Um, and, and so often there's a the, the famous pivot, right, for a startup somewhere along its, its evolution. And so boiling it down to that one thing that you wanna stand for can be really difficult because you don't wanna paint yourself into a corner. And I, I get that. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, working with companies that have been around for 75 years and acquired a dozen other companies, and, and now every decision is made by consensus in a conference room full of 12 people, that's, I think, maybe even harder to get everyone to agree on killing the other 10, quote unquote, great ideas that other people had and saying, no, let's just pick this one, mm -hmm. or maybe this two, these two, and just really focus in on those. Uh, it's, it's tough, and that's, that's part of what we do as brand strategists. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, and you also host a, a podcast about branding. It's called How Brands Are Built. Yep. And uh, you focus a lot on purpose and as the essence of the brand. So uh, what can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, about the purpose of the brand? Yeah. So, so thanks for bringing up the podcast. Um, season one was all about naming, which we've talked about a little bit, um, but it was really focused on that. So if that's interesting to you or your listeners, then go to the first uh, 10 episodes. Season two, the next 10 was really more about positioning, which is what you're asking about. Um, and one of those episodes in particular, at least that I recall, was with Marty Neumeyer, who's a best-selling author, writes about brands and branding. Um, and he brought up purpose. Um, other people have brought it up as well. Um, Erminio Putiniano also mentioned it. Um, there's a lot of talk um, just over the past five, 10 years about brands aligning with a cause. Um, and you see brands like Patagonia that have really positioned around not just an abstract idea, but a really um, sort of socially conscious idea around environmentalism and, uh, and things like that. And increasingly, data shows that millennials and, <clears throat> and younger generations are really interested in um, aligning the, their own personal identity with the identity of these brands that ha have a good cause a good purpose something more to them than just a for-profit company that's trying to get you to buy their stuff yeah. um, and so we're hearing more and more more and more about purpose um, it is sometimes a, an overused or, or abused term like so many other things in branding it can sort of uh, turn into to jargon um, or meaningless buzzword but I think it does have some validity and, and used properly with the right kind of brand and the right kind of situation it can be really powerful Cool. And uh, you brought up millennials and, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of founders and they're obsessed about capturing the millennial uh, uh, market segment. Uh, so <laughs> how do you, how do you think they have, like, they have changed their mindset, you know, from the previous generations? Um, well, one is what I just mentioned. Um, there seems to be data showing that um, I think there's, there's more interest in um, companies that are aligned with some kind of of cause, I think there's also um, more uh, more interest in transparency, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's partly interest in it. It's partly just that transparency is is harder to avoid now for companies. Um, mm -hmm. It's harder to um, to kind of pull one over on consumers, um, and so there's a lot of old school thinking in in branding that maybe is not as relevant anymore. Um, I'll just give you one example. It, it used to be that people would talk about a brand architecture model called um, the house of brands and mm -hmm. Procter, Procter and Gamble is the best example of this. They have yeah. uh, shampoo with one brand name and detergent with another brand name. And for a lot of us, myself included, if you go to the grocery store, 
you can't remember which ones are Procter and Gamble. And so you don't know that these two brands are connected to each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the reasons that, that that approach was taken, not the only reason, and I don't mean to impugn Procter and Gamble, but one rationale for that is that if something terrible happens with sh the shampoo, it's mm -hmm. making people's hair fall out. That's not going to stop me from buying the detergent because I didn't really even realize that, Oh, the same company makes those. Yeah. yeah. These days you see, boycotts on Twitter all the time. I mean, I, it's so easy for one person to do the homework and say, oh, actually, this one company makes all these products, post a list, it goes viral, and you know the secret is out, so to speak. So that's just one small example of, I, I think there's more transparency now. These two things have kind of um, worked in parallel that the, the transparency is partly necessity and, and partly desire on the part of um, millennials and younger consumers. Mm -hmm. But that's why you see brands like Everlane popping up now um, that have the, this ethos of, of radical transparency. And let's just be honest about what what we pay wholesale and what how we're marketing it up to, to marketing it up to sell it to you. Um, people are pretty savvy that that's what's happening, um, and so why not just be in the open about it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, how, what about uh, you know the the amount of choice consumers have these days? Does that have uh, you know the, the, is that uh, an effect of uh, this phenomena of you know um, <coughs> more transparency and, and consumers wanting that from the uh, business? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it's easier to set up a business. Um, uh, you know, especially in the U.S., uh, very very entrepreneur friendly market. Um, you see a lot of these smaller brands popping up and a lot of a lot of them i'm thinking of allbirds for example the shoe company um a lot of them because they're small and because of um the way they can enter the market they, they can afford to really position themselves around a, a cause be really single-minded about product and the way they do things and why they do things um and that's gonna help them cut through in a, a market that's dominated by Nike and Reebok. Um, but it's also going to create <clears throat> more choice. And so I think increases the importance of, of this idea of simplicity and positioning and finding ways to, to differentiate. Cool. Um, and then uh, you have also written a book uh, uh, called How to Write a Naming Brief, a Practical Guide for Branding Professionals. So it's, uh, it's, I haven't read it, uh, to be honest, but sure. uh, you can, uh, you know, to the audience, they can download it for free. I'll uh, yeah. put a link in there in the show notes. But um, it, do you have any frameworks that you share in the book or, uh, you know, uh, uh, advice then, uh, practical advice that people can implement on their own? Yeah, it's, it's full of it. And, and calling it a book, by the way, is, is, uh, is being too kind. It's about 20, it's about 20 pages, I think. So I, I've called it a, a booklet. Um, it's a really quick guide to creating a naming brief. Um, so I mentioned a few times that that's step one. Um, if you're really trying to go through a proper, rigorous brand naming um, project. Yeah. And so it contained, yeah, in terms of practical tools, it, it contains a naming brief template that is interactive in the PDF. You can just type right into it, print it right out from, uh, from the PDF. Um, but it also has some really, I hope, easy to follow steps of how do you figure out the right answers to the questions in the brief? Um, what process should you go through? It walks through, the, through that full naming process that I just mentioned in a, in a little more detail. Um, and I've actually just published a companion booklet that's how to generate name ideas, so how to come up with um, the names once you have the brief. Um, hopefully I'll be doing more more like that so I'm happy to share uh, the links with you yeah and that'll that'll be great yeah uh, naming is something that people need help with for sure yeah um, everybody everybody has to do it yeah that's <laughs> Just right once you got to name your company and maybe some products exactly um, all right so now let's talk about your uh, your professional journey so uh, tell us a little bit about your um, time at HP how was that and how has HP reinvented itself over the years yeah, um, so I was at HP, n not for a huge amount of time, I think it was two years, but it was a really interesting two years because right, I think a month after I got there, Meg Whitman, who was CEO at the time, announced that uh, we're going to be splitting this company up to, into two companies, HP and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So um, during those two years, I got to 
help build the brand for Hewlett Packard Enterprise from scratch, essentially. We worked with an, a great outside agency um, and the, the whole internal brand team was involved, working with senior management um, more than I probably would have been otherwise to, to figure out how that brand was going to be positioned and, and everything else. But then at the same time doing my, my day job, which was mm -hmm. managing hundreds of inbound naming requests um, really throughout HP and then after the split on just the HP side, the mm. blue circle, not the green rectangle. Yeah. Um, and then I also got to help hire uh, an entirely new brand strategy team and, and brand team uh, to go work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise since I split off to the other side. Um, so that was a very interesting, challenging, um, but a great way to, to learn. Yeah, that's cool. It's it's a it's a uh, pretty uh, iconic company. I've had the pleasure of working with a number of people from there, and uh, you know they have an amazing product line. And uh, I believe uh, you know they are also transforming themselves. Like you know, recently their their laptops designs. I mean, it has been uh, changing quite a bit for the better. Yeah, and uh, there's been a lot of change, um, a lot of it after I left, but um, while I was there, a new CEO had to, to step in because Meg Whitman um, went to the Hewlett Packard Enterprise. She's since left. Um, but with the new CEO, new CMO, um, the, the, with the new leadership, and I think, um, you know, the, the idea behind the separation was that it would hopefully make each company a little more nimble and a little more focused. We talked about how focus is important for a brand. Yeah. When I got to HP, it was over 300,000 employees and it, you know, it did everything from services and servers and networking all the way down to um, small personal devices and laptops. Now um, HP is really a mostly laptop printer and, and sort of consumer electronic devices company. And so mm -hmm. I think with that came a little more, um, maybe a little more freedom um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they've been doing some, some innovative things lately. For sure. Um, all right. So then after that, uh, you know, you decided to go uh, and turn yourself into an entrepreneur. So tell us about that decision. Uh, how did it come about and how's it going? Yeah, uh, yeah it's going well. I, I started Heirloom, which is my, my own brand consultancy. Um, I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of freelancers out there doing brand strategy work. Uh, in many ways, I'm one of them. Um, I'm, I'm fully independent, but I partner with other freelancers for projects. So I build small teams. Uh, I don't do design work myself. I mentioned visual identity, but I, I certainly couldn't create a logo for you. But I know the people who can and um, <clears throat> we'll bring them in to, to build a client team as needed. Um, so it's, it's been great. Um, I've gotten to work with smaller companies, but also still some really big ones. Um, I've gotten to partner with people that I never uh, partnered with before. Um, as well as some old friends from from the agency world, um, and we're going into year four, and uh, I'm, I'm awesome. really enjoying it. That's great. Um, and uh, you mentioned you work with uh, smaller companies. So, um, what is the typical profile of a smaller company that you work with? Is it like um, beyond Series A or something like that? Or yeah, well, it's funny because um, uh, one of the one of the companies you had asked me about before before we started recording was was Corelight. I don't know if you want to talk about them still, but sure, sure. I, I was just looking at some of the things they've done since I named that company, and one of them was their Series A round. Um, typically, though, uh, yes, I, it, it's usually companies with some uh, some funding um, so that they can really afford to invest in brand. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to people who are are you know, are, are pre pre funding or um, for whatever other reason, they're not really willing to make an investment and I'll always have recommendations for them, but often it's, it's not come work with me. It's here's what I would do if I were in your shoes. Um, yeah. Typically when I say startup, it's, it's a company that's um, funded and maybe it's been around for a little while. Okay. Um, and you brought up uh, Corelight uh, because of some lack of time. I sort of skipped over that, but tell us a little bit about that. I, I think there you have some sure. interesting story about that, right? Well, I, it was funny. It was a company called Broala, um, and it's based on an open source software project called Bro, mm -hmm. um, which believe it or not was named um, to reference uh, uh, George Orwell's 1984 and Big Brother um, which is kind of creepy, but it is a security software. So it's supposed to be sort of watching over your network like Big Brother. 
Um, but because that was called Bro, and they just needed a name for this company, they called it Broala to rhyme with Koala. They even had a little Koala Bear logo. Mm-hmm. And uh, a new CEO came in, and um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he basically said, I, you know, we, I want to be taken seriously. I think maybe we need to consider a rebrand here. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I worked with, uh, I partnered with uh, a great um, business strategist and um, sort of technology expert, a brand strategist named Karen Williams, who I'd worked with in the past. Um, she came up with a brand positioning and strategy for them, and then based on that, um, I named them Core Light, um, which was getting at this idea of illuminating the, the core of your network. Mm-hmm. And since then, they've rebranded from a visual identity standpoint and gone through Series A and Series B funding, uh, expanded into Europe, made a bunch of strategic hires. And uh, I can't take really any credit beyond the name, but they're they're doing really well. So that's exciting to see. That's great. That's great. And so um, can you uh, share with us, like, you know, it seems like a great success stories. Can you share any other interesting names that you picked? Maybe maybe they were they did really well, or maybe they bombed. Uh, <laughs> Some, some failures. Um, oh gosh, off the top of my, I mean, if you go to my website, you'll see some of them. Um, I have done a lot of uh, naming for Flex, which um, is, is Flextronics, maybe more familiar as Flextronics, although they rebranded a while back to Flex. Um, so I've had a great relationship with them over the past couple of years, naming some products. Um, I named something called PowerPlay, which is a um, consumer-facing um, sort of smart home and solar solution. Um, And that has, I believe, spun off now from Flex. It's still using a lot of Flex branded products, but it's a, I think technically a separate entity. Um, Named a couple of other things with them. Um, I've named, uh, there was a company called GoAnimate um, that sort of similar to Broala, and the name wasn't maybe embarrassing, but they felt like it, um, it pigeonholed them a lot, which is something that, happens a lot with names. If you name yourself a little too descriptively around what you do, yeah. um, it can then make it hard to, to pivot or um, just expand. And so we named them Vyond, V-Y-O-N-D, um, partnered with a great agency in Silicon Valley called Liquid Agency to do that work. Um, so yeah, it's been sort of either renaming startups in a lot of cases or, or naming from scratch um, or going to some of these bigger companies, in which case I'm usually um, hired back multiple times to name products or um, software solutions or cloud platforms or something like that. That's great. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot for all your, uh, uh, you know, all the knowledge that you shared with us about branding. And I think a lot of people uh, got these concepts and will be able to uh, work on their own brand. Uh, now, some of them may want to reach out to you or, um, you know, listen to your podcast. So can you tell us a little bit about how they can reach you, how they can listen to your podcast or, Sure. download your book sure yeah um, I'll give you a bunch of links that you can put on your website so hopefully they can find them there but um, I'm on Twitter at Rob Meyerson um, heirloom my my consultancy is on Twitter and Instagram just as heirloom um, and the blog and podcast is called how brands are built you can go to howbrandsarebuilt.com. that's probably the easiest thing to do and just find all the social links there as well as um, signing up for a newsletter um, finding those those booklets if you want to download them as well. All right, uh, great, uh, Rob. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was an uh, um, amazing experience to learn from you. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So again, I'm Manoj Agarwal, and thanks a lot for joining us on Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. And now, if you are an existing or an aspiring technology entrepreneur, then I invite you to check out my new online workshop, bootstrapping your tech startup dreams. Go to go.tetranoodle.com slash boot hyphen podcast and sign up for free. I want to make sure more successful and sound decisions are made every day in your tech projects. Let's start finding solutions to your problems. So go to go.tetranoodle.com slash boot hyphen podcast and I look forward to helping you with your tech startups.